Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. The Western Writers Hall of Fame has a permanent home at the McCracken Research Library at the center of the American West in Cody with an ambitious and evolving display that commemorates the diverse and colorful contributions of Western writing. We'll hear from the group's president, Kirk Ellis, and from several award-winning Western authors, next on Wyoming Chronicle. Funding for Wyoming Chronicle is provided in part by the Dragicevich Foundation, supporting the work of the Wyoming Community Foundation. We built the Western Writers of America Hall of Fame to really give people an understanding of who the people are who write about the American West. Both are, are members who are in the Hall of Fame itself, who are the, the very pinnacle of Western writing, as well as, and most importantly, those men and women who are writing about the West today and bringing the new stories to us, whether they're for song or poetry, whether they're for a fictional story or something that's history written for children or adults. So we want people to know that, that this Western literature is an ever-expanding and constantly growing um, form of literature that's America's unique literature. This is obviously a very special day for Western Writers of America. Uh, this has been a long time coming, this Hall of Fame. It's also an important day for me personally as president of the organization because it was in fact in 2006 in this building that I first became a member of Western Writers of America. And I was awarded with the best dramatic script spur for my episode of Into the West. And the man who presented me with that award was the then president, Cotton Smith. And I got to know Cotton better when I became a member of the board shortly after um, becoming a member of Western Writers of America. And I discovered that he was not only a great writer and a wonderful man, but he was also something of a visionary. Cotton was passionate about all things Western. I can't tell you the number of times myself and Johnny Boggs and others would get into heated arguments with him about Western film, Western literature, and while I could never quite trust anybody who thought that the best of the John Ford Cavalry films was Rio Grande and not Fort Apache, um, I did come to appreciate Cotton's incredible knowledge of history and the legacy of the West, both in fact and in fiction. And he envisioned at the time this tribute to the organization and to all of its members that would at the same time celebrate both the storied history of Western writing, but also look to the future. Because an organization to evolve cannot be mired in the past. It must always look ahead to another generation and another type of writing. And Cotton did that. So that was over 10 years ago. And we, um, we lost Cotton last year. But I think he'd be pleased by the turnout today and the achievement that the McCracken and WWA have made with this. And I just want to dedicate my remarks today to Cotton because without him and without some of the other pioneers in the organization, like Dusty Richards, who's standing right over there, Dusty, thank you for all of that leadership, because without you, we would not be here today. There are, there are other thanks in order. This project was begun very enthusiastically by my immediate predecessor as president, Sherry Monahan. Sherry, thank you for becoming the catalyst for this. It was pursued with her usual indefatigable energy and persistence by our executive director, Candy Moulton, who many of you know. And to Barry and the McCracken Library Board, I want to take a special thanks. It was impossible to do this without finding appropriate partners, people who really understood the nature of what we were doing. And after several meetings, 
you got it and we're here and I can't think of a more appropriate place for this. So thank you and to all the board members of the McCracken Library and by extension the Buffalo Bill Center for allowing this to be our permanent home. Thanks to all of you. Please give yourself a round of applause. Western Writers has existed for the better part of 60 years now, and for that time, there has never been until now, I'm about to say until today really, a place for us to pay tribute to some of our great writers and the work that's being done by writers who are currently in the organization. And let me just get my notes together. When the organization started, Western writing was a genre. There were Western books, and they could sometimes fit a very specific sort of plot and character line, and they would be set in that sort of end of the West period of the cowboy. But art evolves, and art changes over time, and as more and more practitioners come of age. And over this five to six decades, Western writing has expanded, and WWA has expanded with it. We now give awards out not only in fiction and in nonfiction, but there are awards for dramatic screenplay, for documentary, for poetry, for music. Uh, the list goes on. And the definition of what is, and I don't even want to do the air quotes, called a Western, has changed over time. Our, our motto, trademarked, I might add, so don't anybody try to steal it. I don't know how many writers are in the room, and we always rip each other off, but is literature of the West for the world. And what that means is, if you're writing a traditional Western novel, yes, that's a Western. But if you're also writing a book, say, about the brave firefighters on Granite Mountain, that is a Western as well. If you're writing about the nature, the, the natural life of the environment, those are Westerns. We welcome all of that writing, because it's only through these new voices and you'll see from even from this very difficult to compile list of some of our better known members, it is a very diverse group of people. The West does not belong to any one narrative or to any one culture. It is a story that we continue to learn more about as, as long buried and new emerging voices come to light. And Western writers wants to be on the forefront of this and that is exemplified by this particular installation here at the McCracken Library. I was born and raised in West Texas and I spent quite a bit of time in the American Southwest and so I was always fascinated by the art and literature of that region. And uh, for many years I thought that I would be translating that into a career in archaeology and anthropology, but it didn't happen that way. First it was journalism, then it became writing for film and television. And you don't get all those opportunities to write about the West in the media uh, that you used to. But I've been very lucky in the sense that the few times I've been given that opportunity, I've been able to put that knowledge into the work itself. Stories are identity. And if we let stories die, or if we let the history of the West die, we lose a good chunk of our national identity. And that's why it's important that we not only preserve the stories of the past, but that we always re-examine those stories through new lenses because it's only with the emergence of new stories and new storytellers that we learn a more complete picture of our past, present, and future. My interest um, in the American West transpired into writing the first time I ever went to Tombstone, Arizona. I had been there as a tourist and when I, when I went there I felt immediately connected to the land. Uh, I, I put my boots on the, on the boardwalks and I just felt like I had lived there another lifetime. And so on the way back, plane ride home, I started thinking how I could be connected to this great old town. And my love of food and history and writing sort of all came together in this, my first book, Taste of Tombstone, which is about the food in Tombstone. There's so much great information in Wyoming with the trails and the Indians and uh, there's so many stories that have yet to be unearthed in archives and I write nonfiction and so every time you find one of those little nuggets in other research that you're doing you think oh that could be a great book and all of a sudden you've got a whole new story to tell about Wyoming. I hope that people find um, 
new authors, new information at the Western Writers Hall of Fame and the McCracken Library. Um, it's a great way for us to be able to share with people who come here for the love of the West and the history of the West to follow, find our, our interactives and just to play around and say, oh, I didn't know that person was a Western author. I'd read their books before. I didn't know that. Who else is a great Western author? So by doing that, we really reach a lot of new people. Um, I've had an association um, with the Buffalo Bill Center of the West for well over 25 years and have been on the board here at the McCracken Library um, for at least a dozen years. But also I was uh, president uh, of the Western Writers of America and then for five years the executive director. So it was uh, delightful to be able to merge those two roles together and suggest to the Buffalo Bill and to the McCracken that this would be a perfect place for the Western Writers Hall of Fame. We had long sought a physical place where we could um, promote Western writing, Western literature, and our organization. And serendipity kind of brought everything together uh, right here, and uh, the end result is this wonderful dedication. I feel it's important to preserve the stories of the American West because they speak to something really essential and really true in the American spirit. And it's the idea of individual liberty and the idea of um, taking your fate, if you can, into your own hands. And because the stories tell us where we came from. And even though I live in the East, I have a strong sense of how the West nourished the whole American spirit. And it's a wonderful question because I could, you know, it really makes me think a lot. But um, if we don't know what happened in the West and how the westward expansion happened and what the native peoples before the westward expansion, what their lives were like, we can't really understand where we are today as a nation. It's essential to understanding America. I believe, especially in the West, they're, they're very well exposed to it. And um, I'm interested in expanding that interest to the East. Your question about how children are exposed to Western history is, is so important, because I like to give talks in schools, and I like to have the kids relate to the characters I write about, the real characters I write about, as real people. For instance, when I spoke um, I wrote a book about Charlie Russell called Sagebrush and Paintbrush. And when I spoke to school classes about him, I tried to make his story come alive. I, I found that kids were really interested that he, in, that he practically ran away from home at the age of 16. And he had grown up in St. Louis and had this Western dream, which he finally realized. He, he got a, pre, a 16, birthday present to go west. He went up to Montana to ride the Roundup and really never came back. So when kids learn that history and Western history is about real people and people they can relate to because basically we're all the same, um, I think that's what keeps the stories alive. I love the question of when and where do I write because um, I write in my living room by the fireplace in the winter. And in the summer, we have a little porch where, that I can open the door and hear the, hear the birds. And um, I write in those two places. And when I had my dog, my dachshund, who I lost two years ago, I would say to her, Molly, let's go to work. And she would gallop to the place where all my books were piled up, whether by the fireplace in the winter or on the porch in the summer. So that's the long story of where I write. There are a million stories. And one thing that's really important and that Western writers really tries to promote is that stories about the West are not only about the past. They can be about what's happening today, because there are many issues and many stories that need to be told today. They can also be, um, they can range uh, from anything, from old Western stories to stories about public land use in the year 2017. So 
as long as there's a, there's, as there's a West, there will be stories to tell. Well, I'm one of those people along with Cotton Smith that shoved this program pretty hard. I felt like, yeah, they were with the people from the past, but you had to be dead 10 years. But it's a great place to come look them up, see what books they wrote and things like that. But really, 600 and some members out there writing books every day, and they needed a place for people to come look, maybe look for the book, and then discover who the author is. You know, a lot of people look for riding down the canyon, you know, and so right now they can put riding down the canyon, find out who wrote it and what other books he or she wrote. So I just thought it was a perfect place. And since we have so many modern punch a button and it does things, and we're computer minded, even people my age, uh, it's a, great place to come and write down your favorite author's books and it's a great place to find people because like i said some people know a book by name or heard about it by name they can look it up out there and find out who did it i just it's a better way to help our membership get to the public and we don't have the bookstores that have the bookstores have been closing up like pinballs at a bowling alley and we, we need Western books, and people out there will buy them if they can find them, and especially when they get a favorite author, somebody that really handles the West like they want it and what they believe it was. And if you can do that, you can sell Western books today. So we're doing two things. We're helping the sales for people that are trying to make a living writing books, and we're also exposing the people who wrote some of the great works behind it. You know, I find that young people, if you write an interesting book or read it, I pick up a lot of fans. They said, I felt like I was there with that guy riding through. That's what you gotta create when you're creating a book. You got a lot of responsibility. You gotta take that person along with you and make them believe that he's riding beside that guy and make them believe that he's part of it. And that takes a little time effort and experiment. But if you've got that guy with you, he'll be just like he's riding on a bar K range. I grew up on, on gun smoke and watching old John Wayne movies and stuff like that. And I started out uh, growing up in South Carolina, I wrote more about the South. And then I realized that my interest was more westward because the South was not the West, and the West was not the South. So that's where I became interested in the West and started writing. And I also figured that I could put autobiographical stuff in a Western that was thinly disguised that no one would know that I'm writing about people I actually knew. It's a great place to learn where we come from, the writers who inspired us. For me, it's Jack Schaefer, it's Dorothy M. Johnson, it's Bud Guthrie, and the writers who inspire us today, and those can be Craig Johnson or C.J. Box or Ann Hellerman. Uh, so we learn where we come from and we learn where we are now and we can probably predict where we're going. For me, it's important to, to preserve the stories of the West um, in all of his eras, whether it's the Old West or the New West, because they are the stories of America and they are the stories of the people who have built this nation. Wyoming is a, an area rich in literary tradition and there are always places and people that you can uncover and tell. There are many, many stories of um, the ethnic groups that help settle and build this state that haven't been even touched whether that's Basque sheep herders or um, miners in Rock Springs, those are the stories that, that no one has really told in great detail yet. And, and the stories of the women um, certainly have been told to some degree, but there are far more stories there to tell, as well as the stories of our young people 
very few books have been written that really concentrate on young people's experiences in, in Wyoming and in the West. Uh, Wyoming is my home. I've lived here my entire life. Um, my children are sixth generation in Wyoming, and I, it's just a part of me. And so I, I love to write about this state and find those hidden stories and, and tell about characters that are lesser known than, than some places. I mean, Wyoming, like say, has these rich, rich tradition of literature, and yet there are so many unexplored places, people, and experiences that really deserve the telling. Okay, well, I was born in Colorado, just south of Paradise, and it wasn't my own free will and accord. So it, as soon as I could, uh, when I was finishing my graduate studies, I came to the state of Wyoming. It was purely accidental. Western Wyoming College was paying $4 an hour for shovel bums to do archaeology, and I loaded up the motorcycle and my dog, and away we came. I, I got to Wyoming in 1980, and I was at UCLA working on my PhD on Arapaho history. So I came here to talk to the Arapaho and to write my dissertation and fell in love with the state and could never leave because the archaeology was extraordinary, the history was amazing, the people of Wyoming were, you know, just the warmest people on earth. And I just, I, I love writing about Wyoming because the Western story itself is the creation story of our nation. And it is incredibly important to tell that story, and we do it in so many different ways, you know, from 10,000 years ago to 30 years ago. Yeah, well, we got started with this simply because no one was writing about North America's extraordinary and complex archaeology and cultural history. And th this is part of the legacy about who we are as a people. Americans are not Europeans or Japanese. They are a combination of all of the old world mixed in with a lot of Native American concepts. One person, one vote. Referendum and recall. The idea of a United States, of a confederacy. Not from the old world. And so when you, you deal with... Iroquoian concepts. You're, well, in Cherokee, Creek, Confederacy. But when you start talking about the fact that we have a 15,000-year history, it didn't start with 1492. It started 20,000 years ago. The land in Wyoming cannot help but be a character. And the reason is when you wander through the back country of Wyoming and you're dealing with buffalo and elk and just the sheer grandeur that is the countryside in Wyoming, it's a presence in your soul. And so it ends up being on the page like a character that you're talking to. And I mean, our characters do talk to the land and the animals and the sky. And land the talks back. Yes, it does. Well, and it does talk back. Mm -hmm. She does all the good stuff and I do everything else. Yeah, not exactly correct. Yeah, yeah, you've read our stuff. Everything that you really like, the parts that, that you think are really well done, that's Kathy's writing. Yeah, right. Uh -huh. yeah, anything you thought was a little bit chunky, that's mine. No, do you know what we actually do is, Mike and I have different expertises in the fields of archaeology and history. So whoever's expertise we're writing about actually drafts out the bare bones of the entire plot. And that's, yeah, 250 to 300 pages, the first draft mm -hmm. is of what will be an 800 to 1,000 page manuscript. And then we end up handing it back and forth uh, a dozen times, rewriting each other's writing until we're both happy with it. And it's, we often have people who will come up to us and they'll have one of our books, and they have underlined, I mean, they're very careful and meticulous, but they've underlined everything in pink that they think I wrote and everything in blue that they think Mike wrote. And Mike and I, we always say, Why are you always a, pink? Mike and I always say, that's amazing that you could do that. but. We have no idea who wrote what. The Death Row All-Stars is a unique story that takes place in Rollins, Wyoming in 1911. It centers around the prison in Rollins where a number of the death row inmates at that prison were playing baseball. And the baseball team was, they only played four games, but they were very successful. They, um, the, the men who played it were playing for their lives in the sense that this gave them a purpose. This gave them a sense of being. Playing well helped them to feel as though they were giving back. 
a little bit to society. Um, the problem with the baseball team was there was some underlying betting that was going on. The captain of the team was a gentleman by the name of George Sabin, and Sabin himself was able to come and go out of the prison as often as he wanted to. And he was the one that was laying down some of the bets. Um, it's hard to say exactly for certain how deep the betting went, but there is um, some speculation that it went all the way up to the governor. and. Um, it caused a great deal of controversy in the prison at that time. There were some other things going on because it was a broom manufacturing uh, place at the time too. And so there were uh, a lot of um, controversies going on in the prison. Joseph Singh was the uh, most valuable player for the Death Row All-Stars. And uh, he was in there for a murder that um, may or may not have, he may or may not have been guilty of. And the book, talks about that particular murder as much as it does um, the prison and the activities going on at the prison, primarily with the baseball team. There was nothing like it. I mean, these gentlemen loved baseball. Um, the the uh, warden loved baseball. And as long as they kept that intact, people felt the need to be able to continue to going on. And um, Rollins, Wyoming, had a reputation for having a wonderful baseball team in the Death Row All-Stars and uh, for being one of the toughest places in the West that uh, dealt with prisoners. Um, George Parrott was one of the inmates there at the uh, prison and um, he was um, skinned and his uh, skin was used to make shoes and those shoes were put in, uh, on display at the barber shop. And people knew when they came to Rollins to not perpetrate any crime because they dealt very seriously with anybody who was a criminal there.